All right, five, four, three, two, one. All right, Dave, how's it going today? Thanks so much for joining the Hot Drinks podcast. It's great. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for having me. I, and yeah. I enjoyed all the ones that have been on so far. It's been really fun listening to them. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, it sure is a lot of fun. It's uh, it's more fun than I even anticipated. It's great uh, catching up with friends and, and hearing some some fun stories that, uh, you know, I don't get to hear too much anymore <laughs> these days hanging out with uh, my kids and all. <laughs> it's fun not to be the one telling the stories for once <laughs> around the house. So as we start off with most uh, episodes, I want to hear your favorite go-to hot drink in the field after a long, hard day. Absolutely. Uh, well, it's funny. I think it was mentioned by someone else. I'm not a coffee drinker, which has occasionally come to um, ostracize me in uh, I teams, or I've, I've had to prove that I can make coffee. Um, yeah, I'm with you. In the morning, it's I like Earl Grey tea with some sort of milk product. But my go-to hot drink, like if I'm cold, if it's damp, is always hot chocolate with a little bit of the um, milk powder in there. Um, when I was young, it was hot tang, which huh. I realized soon was probably not going to be good for my teeth. Right. <laughs> Didn't and keep that up too long. It was, well, all through my teens, I think it was, I, right. I grew up in the White Mountains, in New, or I started working in the White Mountains in New Hampshire and uh, someone turned me on to hot tang as a hot drink and I just thought it was the best. Right. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure most kids do. Yeah. I think about how much hot chocolate I drank when I was in the field uh, and I'm like, when I think of it now in my day-to-day -day life and I may have hot chocolate once a week, if that in the winter, I'm like, wow, I drank a lot of that. I'm surprised I still have my teeth. <laughs> I've been drinking a lot with my daughters this winter. We've, um, I found the trick is I can, I can water it down, but then I put mm. a little heavy cream in and they think it's ah. like really good hot chocolate. Uh, mm. So yeah, I'll, I'll take it. Nice. All right. Well, let's let's jump into your first story. Uh, this it takes place in an area I've been to many, many times, the Talkeetna Mountains in Alaska, as well as most backpacking knolls and structures that go to Alaska. An incredible course area, kind of uh, north of Anchorage, a little east of Palmer. Beautiful, beautiful mountain area. What 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 went happened down there uh, many years ago? Well, you know, this was uh, this was pre working for Knowles. I was working for another outdoor uh, organization, and um, it was my first summer working in Alaska and you know it, it's such rugged beautiful terrain and it really is sort of this lawless and as I recall and this was like 98 maybe 1998 um, you know we were root finding most of the way and we had uh, these were high school kids um, and there was a young woman on this trip that we were a little bit concerned about actually sending her home because we're worried about she possibly had an eating disorder. Like she wasn't eating much. Um, and we were just trying to work through with that to see if it was a, a something we could manage over the, I think we were there for, it was a 10 day section. Um, so she was sort of already on our radar and that we were, we had kids leading, um, you know, we were all hiking together, but you know, we had two kids that were typically leading and we were spread out in this group. There's myself and this uh, other woman who was actually the trip leader, I was the assistant. And we were supposed to, the direction was, hey, we're gonna leave our camp, hike down to this uh, river, which was pretty clear. I mean, it was, it was quite clear where it was. And um, we get down there and, and um, I, I'm just gonna say her name was Amy. Um, and everyone's there except Amy. It's a little bit loud, there's a river. And I mean, she was, the person in front of her was like, oh yeah, she was just right there. And all of a sudden she's just gone. And you know, there's really high willows and um, the vegetation mm. there is thick and you're, you're trying to get, um, it's just difficult to see when you're down lower in these, in these drainages. And so we immediately start yelling for her and, um, and she's, you know, she's not answering. Every, every kid's got a whistle. And it's one of the first things we talked about was, and we had whistleblow, um, sort of sequences and so we're blowing whistles like nothing's happening and um, so she was there one minute and then she was gone just yeah, she was gone. and 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 um someone's like oh she probably just went to the bathroom and i was like that then that makes sense so we wait you know five minutes goes by and then i'm talking to the the trip leader and i'm and i'm like okay this is this does not make sense but because we were concerned about her um that it was sort of this heightened sense of like all right this is not um and then all of a sudden these kids were like she's been eaten by a bear and we're like I was like, if she'd been eaten by a bear, we would find her backpack. Like, let's not. And they're like, she jumped in the river. And everyone's going to like, you know, DEFCON 10 or whatever. And uh, so we, we take a few minutes and we come up with this plan to, um, 
the my colleague took uh, half the group and I took the other half the group and we just went um, up river and down river. Um, and I then we came back. I went up this knoll a little bit where we could see and um, a little bit more of the of the drainage, just to see if she was like sitting somewhere. Um, no no signs. Um, and so we come back, this is maybe, we went out for 10 minutes, came back 10 minutes. So now it's probably 20 minutes she's been gone. And, you know, fortunately it's summer and there's long daylight. And this was still, as I recall, the, the details have gotten a little bit fuzzy because it was so long ago, but um, it was, I think it was still pretty, you know, early morning, midday or something, but we weren't concerned about darkness. Um, but then my, I pull the, my colleague, my trip leader partner aside and, and she just broke down. She's like, oh my God, like we've lost this girl. Like every time my phone rings, it, I'm going to be worried it's her mom. And I'm like, okay, hold on. Like time out. Let's, um, I mean, her, her phone rings like after the course, after we get back for yeah, the rest like, of her life, just written it off. Like she's gone. Oh. Like, okay, hold on. like let, let's confirm that, you know, this, we, we can figure this out. And we said, okay, well, let's not lose anybody else. Like, let's just set up right. camp right here. Yeah. Don't make and, it worse. Um, as I'm talking about it, I'm thinking it was, you know, this was later in the day. I, I just based on, we didn't, we hadn't gotten to where we were going, but anyway, we said, let's just camp here. Let's have, um, we had some, you know, as every course trip, you have some strong students, you have some students that, um, you know, I wanted to split up and take a few in one direction. And then some that would just stay and like set up tents, cook food. So I went with two or three um, kids and she went with two or three kids and we were just going to hike in a longer, um, just kind of, we, we didn't really map it out too much, but a uh, longer search pattern than we agree would, we would meet back. So we started hiking up and we get up to this rise where we can see really far down river. And um, I saw these, um, I mean, I thought they were tents and I was like, well, okay, wow, there's, maybe that's an hour bound group or a Knowles group. Um, and, and I was like, maybe she saw that and she's just going to head in that direction because she thinks that's she, she can't think it's us because we haven't even set our tents up, but um, you know, maybe she thinks it's people or whatnot. So we just decide to, you know, this is, I don't know what the time frame is now in my head. I feel like she was missing for multiple hours, but by, by the time we, I mean, I don't want to ruin it, but we did, we did find her. But um, anyway, we get up to this Ridge, we start walking, we start to find footprints and they're kind of like staggering a little bit. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, like what's, um, so the closer we get to this, um, what I think is this group of tents, it's one of these ab abandoned mines in the Talkeetness and it's just got these tarps on it. And I was like, oh God, like, um, so, so my heart sank a little bit, but I was like, well, maybe she's still walking towards that because there's these tarps. And um, so we continue on because now we're following footprints and um, we come around the corner and there's Amy sitting on her backpack and the, and I, and I, still remember like I think to this day like 20 some odd years later it's still like the purest moment of joy I've ever experienced in my life with the exception of the birth of my daughters where I see this girl sitting there and, and she's like Dave and I was like you know like and, and then I was like what happened you know, uh, and she's like you'll be so excited I ate all the food in my backpack and so because we had you know been talking to her about our concerns about her eating oh, and, right, um, right. So she's okay. She's fine. We're walking back to the rest of the group. And I said, Hey, what, what happened? Did you, um, she said, well, I got to the river and I didn't see anybody else. And she was in front. Um, and she said, I waited for a second, but I didn't see anybody. So I just kept walking. Cause you know, I'm, I've been slower. I thought I might be behind people. Um, I'm like, did you hear us yelling? And she said, yeah, I heard people saying stop, but I still thought I might've somehow ended up behind you. So I kept walking. And then I realized that Maybe that wasn't the right thing to do, but I was a little bit twisted around. So I just kept walking and uh, she heard us blowing whistles. Um, and so we talked about it a little bit and, you know, ironically, Sean, it was such a great turning point for her. Like she, yeah. the rest of the trip, she was um, eating like a horse, totally engaged. And uh, um, wow. so I look back at it as one of those near misses that, that had a, a great outcome. And, uh, you know, I also thought about like, okay, what could we have done differently in, in, you know, talking to these students. And it was also just this really bizarre set of circumstances that, I mean, I, part of me still wonders if she wandered off a little bit 
and then all of a sudden realize that okay wait this was not right okay but um it it could have been it could have been much worse than it was and i i can still picture where if i close my eyes these i was like oh great there's some tents over there and as we got closer i'm like oh those aren't tents no man what a sinking feeling what was the uh feeling of the rest of the students when they found it were they just like whatever oh, like scratching this, their head or were they pissed off or what no there was like this euphoria that she was back especially because everyone went you know to this dark place right away and right. then um, you know we we sort of talked through it and i think we revisited our you know our lost protocol <laughs> and um and you know i think it was a pretty good bonding you know nobody, nobody was upset with her it was right. i think his folks were pretty scared. Um, and I'm sure, you know, now these folks are probably in their early thirties or whatever. And they're, maybe they're telling that story a little bit differently, but I, I think it was a good learning experience. I mean, it's definitely one of the memorable parts of our trip. That's for sure. Yeah. Wow. And, you know, we have these moments where we're just like in the back country and, and something happens and you're just like, man, how am I going to tell the parents, <laughs> you know, I'm sure that was going through your head. <laughs> Well, so. that's not right at the beginning because I was like, okay, if we go there right, right now, <laughs> we're all going to lose so it. We can't do that. Uh, but as we were walking like towards this, you know, abandoned mine area or whatever it was, I definitely was like, okay, um, gosh, I really, you know, I'm not even going to, I was trying to not let my mind go there. And right. I find myself in those experiences where I feel very real. It's very real and I feel very present. I'm like, okay, let's just take this one step at a time. Um, yeah, yeah. But there was a part of me that's like, um, we have no communication devices. We're in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And and there's real hazards, especially in that area. You know, the bears hang out in yeah. the willows by the rivers and, yeah. and the rivers itself for the hazards, like two biggest hazards are, are right there. Well, I still have a picture. I, I found it a couple of months ago of, um, of that trip where we were down at the river um, and there was a, there was a grizzly footprint and I took my, my boot off and my sock and I put my foot, my 10 and a half foot in the footprint. And it was, and it was still not bigger than the footprint. And I was, you know, marveling at how small my big feet are. Wow. <laughs> um, I just want to, do you have a hard stop at the top of the hour or, or can you go? Okay. I can go better. We might go a little longer. We'll see. We chat a little bit at the beginning. Um, wow. That's fantastic. It's um, and then the rest of the trip carried on. No problems. No major yeah, problems it, like that? No, it, it really was like this pivotal, it, it was sort of a bonding experience that would have been great yeah. to have without um, those few hours of um, yeah uncertainty. Panic. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, and I see like those types of things often happen in the first two days and you're just like, we just haven't had a time to teach that class or we haven't taught that, you know, lost protocol or whatever. It's like, gee, we can't teach everything in the 24, first 24 hours. Well, what was really interesting was when, when she said, well, I heard people yelling stop. And I was like, well, and, you know, at, at that point it was like, I was just more, I was so grateful that we were, she was there and she was okay. Right. Um, and I, I think I wanted to, I think an older version of myself might've you know, maybe later on, ask some more questions. Like, hey, sure. can we revisit that? And, you know, like a few days later. And yeah. uh, my 23-year-old version of me was not, not Let's there. Get on, right on. Awesome. Well, I'm glad that ended up uh, safe and, and she's fine. <laughs> and, uh, I, I could see it happening. You know, the eyesight is, it's hard to see in those areas with that. And it's hard to hear. Yeah, but, with, uh, the, with the river, I could see how it'd be a little bit confusing for sure. And it's just so, um, when you get right down in those drainages, there really yeah. is um, not, you know, not much, even when you're really close to people. Yeah, absolutely. As we All right. from, oh yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Let, let, let's move on to the, to the next uh, story from, uh, from your days with Knowles. This is one of the many NASA trips, uh, for people who don't know, NASA uh, has done trips for years with Knowles, uh, some custom education trips focused on leadership development and that, and, and you had the fortune of working a few of those. Dave, tell us about what happened yeah. on, on one particular course. Well, this one, it wasn't a specific NASA course. It was one of these, um, I think they're marketed as executive leadership courses. And there's an executive leadership kayak and exec executive leadership llama packing. And so this was one of the llama packing mm -hmm. courses in the winds. And it was, I mean, it was just phenomenal because uh, I, the first time I went llama packing, I said, why am I, why am I carrying a backpack? <laughs> I've had back problems in the past. And this, this is great. This llama right. is carrying a lot of stuff and I've got a day pack. So we were, um, the joke um, 
I don't think this was the joke in admissions, but um, people would say, what do you mean? You're work what does that mean? You have it's executive course for llama. I'm like, yeah, it's for people that can't carry their own weight. Um, <laughs> um, right. And they were really wonderful people. And so this one fellow uh, worked for NASA and just an incredibly wonderful, ludicrously intelligent person and uh, really mild mannered. Um, a couple distinct memories I have of him was um, we did a summit hike one day and we got on the subject of this book Tribe by Sebastian Younger. I'm not sure if you, you're familiar with it. Um, and, and he was talking- Who grad as well? Yeah, that's right. And, yeah. Uh, and he was just talking about, because um, he was also in the, he was in, involved with NASA, but he was also in the Navy. And um, mm -hmm. he was talking about um, servicemen and women he had worked with mm -hmm. and in how the book really resonated with him. So I remember having this really, just really deep, wonderful conversation hiking down from this, peak from him with him, but um, we were in the winds. This was mid August, just, I don't know, five or six years ago, or some, something maybe four or five years ago. And uh, we were split up into three groups. I was working with Lynn Petzold and, and Rick Rochelle. And um, we, Lynn was already in camp and she she came to the trail and she said, Hey, there's a, there we've, we've had a bear sighting. Um, there's a black bear, you know, not, not huge, but um, you know, we, we kept seeing him. We're, we're sticking to everyone's staying together. We're trying to get the bear fence up. And then, um, and I don't know if Rick's group had gotten there yet. I think it was the second group. So we, I start bringing my camp in and, and we get this briefing from Lynn and we say, okay, we're going to keep everybody together. Uh, but let's, you know, let's get our food in this, in this bear fence. And um, all of a sudden, uh, all of a sudden we hear this guy, uh, he yells out, the fucker has my food bag. And he starts, we see him run over the hillside and he's chasing after the bear. And I'm like, whoa, whoa. Lynn and I are like, whoa, no let him go. We've got 12 people with food bags. And uh, I mean, and it was not his cook group. It was just, it was his specific food bag. And he right. was, um, so we, you know, we got him to stop and um, his reaction just, you know, afterward, we were just laughing about how the first thing he thought of was like, not that, okay, there's a bear. I should give it some distance. Um, it was, that's, that's my property. It's my food. And, and you don't have the right to take it. I don't wow. care if you're a bear. And yeah, uh, he had the fight or flight kick in. Yeah. yeah. He was <laughs> ready to fight. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so we, um, everyone else gets into camp and we regroup and the bear just keeps coming back. And so we're making, oh, wow. noise. we decide we're going to um, camp a little more um, sort of like in a grizzly, uh, like, aggressive bear territory with everybody like i mean we had i think we put everybody in two under two flies right next to each other and um it's a black bear i assume in the winds it was a black bear yeah. yeah um and and i would describe it as assertive but not aggressive like he was okay. um just kind of like hey well, why don't you guys leave me alone i want i just want your food I'm all right gonna you're in my house <laughs> yeah, exactly not um so so we ended up um Rick and I were trying to figure out where, uh, cause he got, he just had the one food bag, but we were trying to get him. We thought, well, maybe if we can, if, if he gets close enough, if we spray him, then he just won't come back. Um, cause we'd been making noise. Cause we were a little bit worried what was going to happen in the evening. Um, and we had, I think we took watch through the night. I don't remember specifically, but we ended up tracking, uh, and we, and we let this student come with us because it was his food bag. And, and, uh, so it was Rick and myself and the student, and we kept a, a good distance from the bear. We all had bear mace and um, we must have tracked him for like, I don't know, half an hour, 45 minutes. And we found the food bag. Um, but the, it was funny. The bear would just, you know, he was just walk. He'd look back at us and then he would just look at us like, you know, leave me alone. Like I'm, I'm supposed I, to be the one following you. <laughs> I'm going to come back and get your food. And, and who I follows the bear. <laughs> well, what's that? I said, who, who follows the bear people? They're not, they're not used to people coming after him. And that's what we were talking about. Like, okay, we're not, we're not, he's not aggressive, but if we can, um, can we try and let him know that we're not going and we're making lots of noise. We're, and, um, and we never really got close to it. Um, but every time we would come back to camp, the bear would come too. So that's when we said, well, geez, maybe if we can actually get some, I'll, I'll say this was Rick's idea in case, you know, some bear experts said it was a bad one, but I, I don't remember <laughs> it was. if we could actually, um, if we sprayed it, if that would deter it from coming back. Cause we were a little bit concerned about what the evening would look like. Um, anyway, we, we ended up not really getting close enough to spray it or, um, and not really trying to aggressively pursue it in that manner. 
Um, we did get the food bag back. We didn't, because he had ripped it open and eaten some of the stuff, we, we said that's, you know, John, or well, now you have to beep that out, but uh, um, we said, you can't have your food. You know, we're gonna, you can get everybody else's food. Um, so adding to that, we wake up the next morning and we had six llamas. And um, the deal with the llamas is you have to pick at them. So they all have these that leads about 12 feet long. And then there's a pick that look a picket that looks like a cork. I mean, like a huge score corkscrew. It's probably four inches in diameter and you wrench it into the ground. And, um, you know, there were some places where we camped in the winds where it was tough to find. You're just in rocky soil. And mm -hmm. the concern is if they pull the picket that you're looking for a llama. And we, you know, one of the things that we had learned from the llama handlers was that the llamas will try to go back home uh, oh, yeah. if they get lost. And, and they wanted us, understandably, they wanted us to return with the same amount of llamas we left with, um, kind of like students or anyone mm -hmm. else. You know, that's that's one of your. So goals. it's just the instructors. There's no llama handlers on your trip. No, right, exactly. They gave us a they gave us a quick little tutorial, um, <laughs> and um, and the llamas are. I mean, they're really great. They need to. They're pack animals, so you have to have an even number of them. Um, and they're pretty mellow. Although we had a couple stubborn. Rick got spit at. Uh, and he got stuff in his eye. Um, oh, that might have been on a previous course, and he just told me so much. It, it seemed awful, painful. And it was if they don't want to go up something steep, and you, you know, really, if if you try and convince them, then that's when they can get a little ornery. But for the most part, sure. they were really wonderful. There's Ranger was my favorite llama, and um, I have a picture on my wall with Ranger and I. He's just a wonderful animal. Anyway, we wake up and we have five llamas, not six, oh, and. No. Uh, so the bear came back. This is what we hypothesize is the bear came back, spooked the llamas. So when we're going to get the llamas, that's when we realize we're like, wait, we're, we're down a llama. And I look over and I'm like, oh no, it's Summit, who's our largest llama. And, and instantly I'm like, oh, I, I picketed Summit. Like I, Summit, I, uh, I no. like, oh no. That's that <laughs> feeling, yeah. It's like, did it, I tie it, up that boat? Did I yeah, right, that llama? Exactly. <laughs> I'm like, Summit was my llama. And um, the, and I was like, I know that that picket was in there because I was really because a couple of times it was hard to find a good, um, a good purchase. And this was in sort of uh, not really damp, but like a meadow where it was really in there. So I'm like, oh, my gosh, I, I, I was confident that was in there. And then fortunately, one of the students goes over and goes and kicks this thing. And he goes, oh, you know, here it is. And he he pulls the picket and the picket is still in the ground and it's bent and the llama. This was it was the youngest and I think really strong some as I remember and he broke there's a metal ring that connects oh, to the picket and he broke that ring off so now we have this missing llama with a 12 foot lead attached to it um and I was most concerned about llama about about the llama but I was I felt a little vindicated I was like I'm so glad that that picket is there um that feeling so then i um the plan was i think we called out to let the llama handlers know and i think we called um the rocky mountain to let them know that we were um, we had all our students but we were missing a llama and um and then i went and on this completely futile mission to hike down the trail for you know we agreed that there was no harm in it but probably wasn't going to be um that helpful but while everyone was packing up i just went and kind of slow slowly jogged down the trail of a couple miles calling for summit which was you know <laughs> like the llama's gonna come back um we never found we never found summit and um and the concern oh. is with this picket or with the 12 foot lead is that they if they get it caught on something and no one finds them then they're just gonna starve to death and, and so we were really we were really genuinely concerned about the well-being of this llama and um, I think we had two days left and we called the handlers. Um, we got back into town. They still hadn't found him. Um, uh, Rick. What did you do it, with all the food and equipment that the, that llama was carrying? If I remember last? correctly, they, they carried 40 pounds per side and 10 on top or maybe 30, 30, 10. So we split it amongst, um, cause we were later in the course. So we'd eaten right. down a bit more food. So we just split it up and then we put sure. some in the packs we had. Um, so we managed that. But, you know, the group was, we were all just like, oh gosh, hopefully, you know, someone spotted Summit. So we went and put signs up at the trailheads when we got out. Um, and we asked the, the folks at the, the branch to do, this, to do the same thing. But when we left, there was still no sign of Summit. And then um, Rick was going on, on trail runs um, with Shannon and some other friends of theirs. No, no sign of Summit. And then 
I got an email maybe four days after the course that Summit showed up at the parking lot at the trailhead that we left at and no uh, way. still had the lead on, if I remember correctly. Um, and he got checked out by the vet and he had a scratched cornea, um, oh, which they were, you know, which was able to probably from a branch or something, which he was able to recover from. But uh, so the, there was a happy ending to that. Um, but we all left this, you know, the students and we all left a little bit dejected, like, oh gosh, like what, you know, what happened to this llama? And um, yeah, it was, it was an exciting um, probably 24, 36 hours uh, with it. And I don't know what happened to the bear, you know, hopefully it was relocated because I'm assuming they probably would have, um, I actually, when we went, got out, I think there were more reports with the forest service of a, of some, mm. of an assertive bear, you know, but right. you know, no one had bitten, bitten, but it just, it seemed like a um, bad outcome for the bear. If it's, if it's behavior kept, you know, obviously sure. there had been some sort of um, exposure to food or what, I mean, cause it really was not afraid of us at all. Yeah. Yeah. What a kind of a coincidence, I guess, having that bear encounter and then the llama missing. It's just like, it was too close. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but that was, uh, summit. Um, it was, it was a happy ending. You know, we were all like relieved. We had this email chain of our whole student group and everyone was really excited to see that, that summit. Right. So so you managed to get your paycheck at the end. They they didn't hold that (laughs) for the llama. (laughs) That was the other thing because we were, I, I know that was actually, um, one of the things we were talking about was that's a pretty hefty price. The the llama. Yeah. Yeah. But those courses are still happening. I think there's three sections this summer. So, I don't know. If, I don't know if Summit got to, you know, yeah, opt right. out on his rap sheet for the summer. And be like, nope, don't, don't send me with those guys anymore. Yeah, right. <clears throat> I think they have a new, um, a new peg for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah That's week. hilarious. Wow. That's funny. Yeah, llamas and animals in the backcountry are, you know, it's so unpredictable, and you never know what's going to happen. They're, they're great when it's working, but when it's not, then it's uh, it can be yeah. all haywire. I used to do, uh, before and I also did a bunch of horse packing trips and. Um, those are always, you know, and they always seem to be more work. <laughs> like it it yeah. sounds nice. You're not carrying your packs, but you get to camp and it's like your first hour is just with the animals before you even touch your stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So in some ways and, they can be know, more work. The addition though was, it was really nice to sort of, um, to be able to just interact with these, with, with these really cool animals in the, in this. Yeah. It, it wasn't like we were moving faster because uh, they don't go that fast. It, it made me think about being able to bring my my kids who mm-hmm. are still pretty young and can't carry a lot of weight like further into the backcountry and, mm-hmm. and other folks that for whatever reason can't carry a lot of weight to maybe get to some areas that they wouldn't be able to and that's right. um yeah, that makes sense I, I like the allure that, that those options there yeah so you haven't you haven't taken your kids yet with the llamas i wanted to last summer i was going to try and do an alumni llama packing trip and bring them on it but with COVID, everything got shut down right. so no i now i just take them haul their own stuff right we just don't go very far i just take them canoeing now <laughs> yeah we i took them rafting last summer that's a lot easier yeah. you can put right. a lot on, on a boat absolutely right on awesome i love that story let's uh let's talk about uh, this is our first kind of uh, wilderness medicine course obviously what is medicine is a big part of, of outdoor education and, and just about every outdoor educator has been through one or multiple wilderness medicine courses and I know you've been doing a bunch of teaching over the years and I probably have lots of stories just from those courses alone but this kind of one significant story stood out for you let's hear about it yeah this one this one stood out um, for, for a number of reasons uh, this was I think 2015 and it was in the spring and I, I run a lot of wilderness medicine courses, a lot of woofers and research in the Bay area. And there's a climbing gym that I've been running courses at for, for many years. And it's a, you know, it's this cavernous climbing gym. It, it's part of the, in the Presidio, which used to be a military base. And so they, it used to be uh, an air, an old airplane hangar. Um, so they've got this, these really beautiful glass door, garage doors that come down and they open it up and there's, I don't know how, how high up it goes, but pretty far. And then there's a yoga studio that we use for the, the classroom. But for security, they won't let us out any door except the front door because they don't want people coming and going in the gym. So whenever we go out to do a scenario, we have to walk basically through the climbing area and then outside to this uh, big field. And um, I, I think we were on day seven, which if I can remember correctly, is the day we do CPR because we were coincidentally teaching CPR that, that day. And, uh, of a 10 day course of a 10 day course. Right. And, um, actually, yeah, I think that is right. And, um, 
all of a sudden we were going outside for a scenario and this guy who, um, who was just a funny guy in the course, like he had a real dry sense of humor and, um, and he, he was really understated in, in, uh, in the way he presented himself and, and, and sort of calm. So he was going out the, cl- out the classroom to walk through and, he, and then he looked back and he was like, hey, he's like, there's someone unresponsive out here and people are you know, asking for help. And I, my first thought was like, oh, that's funny. Cause we were going out to do a scenario. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you know, sometimes we'll just give some pitch when we prep people. And, and then he was like, no, no, I'm serious. And so I went out and I uh, was t- teaching with uh, this wonderful woman, Thea Sittler, uh, who's been a longtime field instructor and wilderness, med instruct- wilderness medicine instructor. And I think she's in PA school now, which is great. Um, and so we went out there and the first thing I saw was this guy uh, doing really great chest compressions on this young woman. And I went over and I said, Hey, I'm an EMT. Do you, um, do you need any help? And, um, and the gym's packed with people. This is, you know, middle of the day. Oh. And it might, I don't know what that, it was probably a weekend. Um, and our whole class was just standing there. And, and the first thing going through my head is, Oh my gosh, there's this, this young woman who's in cardiac arrest and we're, you know, knowing that, likelihood of survival without a number of things um, like an AED and being close to a hospital, the survival's not that great. And I was like, well, that's the first thing I thought of. And, and her brother was there and he was, you know, understandably distraught. Um, but we were in a, you know, pretty urban area. Uh, so he said, you know, listen, she just collapsed. I can't find a pulse. And he stopped. And we felt for pulses again, couldn't find a pulse. And she had these agonal respirations, which if you remember from your last CPR mm-hmm. class, these just really occasional deep gasps. Um, and they, they look really disconcerting, but they, you know, this woman was so young that it took me a second. I, you know, we, we just checked, there's no pulses though. So he kept going with compressions. I started breathing for her. And then um, someone showed up at the AED that they had in the gym, gave it to Thea. Thea put it on her and, um, and then we turned the AED on and said, shock advised. And that was the first time when I was absolutely mm. convinced that she was in cardiac arrest. Because wow. even though I know how to check well for pulses right. and, and we were, you know, there's two of us doing it. And it turns out this guy was in, uh, he was taking an EMT course somewhere he had said afterward. And he hadn't finished, but. Um, I've always and, been concerned about that of like, you know, sometimes we're in class and I can't find the pulse on my patient that I'm trying to to do yeah. CPR on that's perfectly alive and healthy. I'm like, how am I going to find it on someone that's marginalized? You know? And then, so when, so when the AED said shock wow. of eyes, and, and I actually was so focused on, you know, waiting for when he got to 30 to go breathe for her that right. he had to sort of tap me on the shoulder and say, okay, you know, back up. So we shocked her and then he immediately started doing compressions and I, I went down to breathe for her and all of a sudden her eyes just opened up and she took this big gasp and- wow. um, and I said, you know, hey, if you can hear me, squeeze my hand. And she squeezed my fingers and I asked her name and she told me her name. And I said, you know, you're at the climbing gym and you've had an accident. Um, and so she, you know, then um, the, this, is, this is a national park, then the- uh, A the national fire, park within the city of San Francisco. Yeah, so the Presidio is part of the Golden Gate National Park or Golden okay. Gate Natural Recreation Area. Sure. So all of a sudden um, park police and- um, and a National Park Service ambulance show up. And, uh, and their response time is really fast. This was maybe five or six minutes. Um, and I said, I said, well, she was um, in cardiac arrest and um, she was given one shock and we resuscitated her. And the guy's like, no, 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 no. Are you, are you sure? I'm like, no, we, we, we definitely shocked her. And, and you know, we were definitely doing CPR. And um, so they took her, you know, they, they transported her. And then all of a sudden, then it were just everybody, you know, she's gone and we're all, nice. there's a gym full of people, our whole class and, and her brother who after the, um, I think right after that, or maybe during that, it was either Thea or one of our students went and, you know, sort of moved the brother out of the immediate scene, which was just a really thoughtful and incorrect move and astute decision um, because he was, you know, really upset, understandably. And um, so we actually, I don't, it wasn't whatever day it was, we had an evening session that night. And so we, you know, we, we were supposed to, or no, we, whatever it was, we're supposed to be debriefing. And we said, let's just take a break. Um, <laughs> and we, we talked for a little while, but then we said, let's go get some food and we'll come back. And so we scrapped the whole rest of the evening and just had this debrief with our students of like, Hey, what, you know, 
what did you see? And Thea and I had this whole debrief and um, it was incredibly real and surreal at the same time. Um, and, you know, we had to talk with the gym and with the, you know, park police and the, and the fire department. Um, but what was really fascinating was this, so this woman, because the gym, you know, after, you know, they have security tapes and they said that when she collapsed, she was, she was really just starting to climb. And it turns out she was born with this um, electrical uh, impairment in her heart that she had never, she'd had a couple of fainting episodes. And when she'd mm -hmm. gone to the doctor, they told her that, um, that she probably hadn't eaten enough. They didn't do any work up or anything. And um, I'm forgetting the name of it uh, right now, but um, she, it's, it's it tends to happen with people in their twenties and they end up just dying because it's usually in a, you know, a situation where there's no one to, right. to resuscitate them. Wow. And um, so the gym, she collapsed. That guy was climbing right next to her, um, had someone call 911. We came out of the classroom like 30 seconds later. So it was all this best case scenario stuff. Right. There was trained people on site, this guy next to her. There was an AED 50 feet from where she was. Um, so we, she was clinically dead for probably about three minutes, according to those tapes. And then we, she was resuscitated and then the ambulance came at about five minutes, which is still phenomenal response time. Mm. Um, and I had the opportunity to go, uh, I was probably about four months later, we, we had, I had asked to reach out to her, but the way we left it with the gym was, why don't you give her, her us, our contact information? If she wants to reach out, great. And, um, and we got an email from her and, um, I went and had coffee with her and it was a really, mm. uh, it was just an amazing experience because in yeah. she was 20 years old. And, um, wow. so she was in the hospital for, I think five or six days. She had a, a pacemaker implanted. Um, mm. and she thought that she had very little memory of, um, I like sort of flashed in and out of, as to what had happened. Um, and it was really funny cause we, um, we had this wonderful guy in our class. He was a former army ranger. He was in his seventies, just a wonderful person who was schooling all of these 20 year old students. He was just, uh, you know, whether we were out in the rain or whatever it was. Um, and I relayed out, we became friends and I relayed after I met with him and he said, she said, you know, I was climbing and I don't remember anything. And then, um, and then I, woke up in the hospital and he goes, Oh, so that's, what's going to be like when I die. Like that was, he's like, I'm just not going to wake up. And uh, that, that was his take on the situation. But um, she said she had very little recollection. And um, she said, I'm really sorry. I don't remember what you looked like. And I, and I said, <laughs> well, you were dead when we first encountered each other. And um, wow. so that's okay. It's understandable. I said, and you look a lot better. Uh, <laughs> and um, we've kept in touch It's five or six years later. And um we occasionally email each other. She lives up in the Pacific Northwest and works in real estate. And uh, the the thing that I tell students when I'm teaching CPR about that, a couple lessons for me in that one is that there's always luck involved. She and her brother were going to go jogging on Ocean Beach, which um, so Ocean Beach is basically this, you know, maybe six mile beach along the coast of California on the outskirts of San Francisco. And there, you know, there's people out there but there's a lot of places where there's nobody or uh, and there's there's cell service, but you might not encounter anyone. And if they had jogged on Ocean Beach and this had happened, the chance of her surviving would have gone down considerably just because they might not have been anyone else around. Or if it was mm -hmm. just her brother and he was trying to do CPR, there's there's definitely no AED anywhere near there. Um, so there's a little bit of luck involved. You know, he said, yeah. hey, I, I just started going to this climbing gym. Do you want to go check it out? So they, they changed plans sort of at the last minute. Um, and the other things that I, I remember talking to Todd uh, Schimmelfenig about this, you know, when I was trying to breathe for her, um, you know, cause we do all these things on mannequins and I've had a couple other uh, experiences um, breathing for people since then. Um, but this was the first time I'd actually done CPR on somebody. Um, actually, that's not true. There was one other one that was not successful and this, um, just trying to get those breaths in because when you have agonal mm. respirations there's still some airflow and it can be you know going in the wrong direction and you know possibly pushing up against your breath or the tongue is in the way and you don't have the head open far enough and um i remember beating myself up of like oh i only got one out of those two breaths in and just saying well you know you're doing the best you can and and 
really crank that head back even further. Don't worry about hurting this person. Um, you know, she had really long hair. She was on this gym mat. So moving her head was actually a little bit harder. Um, and the other thing I distinctly remember was because she was on this bouldering mat was my first thought was, geez, we should get her in these walkways that are concrete because, mm -hmm. you know, you don't do CPR in beds, you know. But the guy, when he was doing compressions, was her chest was really going down. It wasn't like her whole body was moving. So the mats were firm enough. But I had voiced this out loud. And then some voice in the back was like, don't move her. You're not supposed to move her. And it was just some random person in the gym. And we we were discussing it later. And, and I remember thinking, gosh, you don't, you know, you got to tune out these voices that mm. um, maybe don't know what they're talking about. Uh, because if if his compressions weren't working, then we would have been doing such a disservice to leave her on this, this bouldering pad. Um, and I remember thinking after, okay, it was a good decision to leave her there and thinking about, you know, paying heed to this person who, you know, whose first thought was moving her is bad because we know moving people is not bad. People get moved all the time. Um, and so there were some really interesting points that we got from, from that experience. And, you know, the, the feedback from the students after was, you know, I mean, what a transformative experience from mm -hmm. a learning experience of, um, oh my gosh, we've been teaching this and or we've been learning about it. And then we, right. we see it in action. And um, so you didn't say there just before it all went down, Hey, I got a teachable moment. Just come follow me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey everybody come up. No, <laughs> the first thing I thought of was like, oh my gosh, this is awful. There's this woman that is dead and she's going to stay dead and our whole class is right here and there's a gym full of people and her brother's here and uh and then i was like okay well we're going to do the best we can and happens that she's young and then um there's an aed right there and and we're mm -hmm. going to do this really well and uh you know and so when i'm teaching cpr classes i i often tell that story of and especially folks that have taken cpr so many times and they get bored with it like hey listen work really hard when you do these compressions and 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 practice like it's somebody that you really care about or that you don't know, because if you have the opportunity to, to help somebody get resuscitated, it's pretty damn cool. Like I, mm. I love getting emails from, I mean, I see her post that we were friends on Instagram or something. And it's, I mean, it's hard for me not to think of, I have this picture in my mind of that whole experience. And I'm like, yeah, that's really cool. Uh, I'm, mm. you know, you haven't, if you have an opportunity um, to do something that might benefit somebody in their moment of need, it's important that your skills are up to snuff because boy, that would be a, a, a missed opportunity with a possible terrible outcome. And so, yeah, um, yeah it was in the, I still have people actually from that class that research and it, it, it just comes up, it comes up, but like something that's memorable for them. And, um, you know, I, I hope that it does not happen again on a course. Um, and I, in recently, a couple of years ago, I think there was a, there was actually a cardiac arrest on a, Knowles course there was a Knowles student in a EMT course I think and um the uh I think it was Todd and Marco and uh Dan Zachs resuscitated this student in, you know with the help of the with the help of the other students which was just wow. another amazing transformative experience yeah um, when I did my first woofer it was in North Carolina I was working with Outward Bound there and there's a group of, uh, I think they're probably semester students that were doing it uh, with uh, a group of instructors um, that some were researching in that. And um, they went on a, on a day off, they went on a paddling trip at a nearby river and one of the students dislocated his shoulder. And I, I guess the day or two before it was when we did dislocations. And so all of a sudden everybody's like, I want to do it. I want to do it. I want to do it. <laughs> Yeah. You didn't, unfortunately, you didn't have time for people to be like, Hey, I dibs. I want the, I want the breathing right, right. here. Let me, let me take over the breathing. You can do the chest. <laughs> do the other shoulder, do the others. There's a lot right. of us. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. Well, uh, yeah, I'm sure she was uh, obviously thrilled that you were there and you know, it's amazing. We, you do so many of these recertifications, you do so many of the training and, and the reason you do it is because you want it to be reactionary. You know, yeah. if you sat down and took out, got out your book, <laughs> and we're right. like, right. what was that page again for resuscitation? You know, it's just like, you right. don't, you don't realize that you're going to be able to react to this until it happens. And, and obviously they, you know, the curriculum is this way and you teach it in this way for this reason, because there is enough data and field experience to show that, you know, repetition does work and, and it does come back at a time of need when it's current in your brain. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's, you know, sometimes when I'm, 
when we are, when things do get repetitive, it's just, you know, telling something like that or even a snippet of it, Hey, let's just, let's work really hard on, here's the skills that are important. You know, yeah. does it matter if you know all the science and all this? No, but here's what we want. You, like work really hard at this because if you, if, if you come upon that situation, then you're going to want to show up with your A game. Right. Well, you know, they say the best teaching is stories and, and you get a good one for your students for, yeah. for now to eternity. I think they'll, they'll listen a bit more, you know, if, yeah. uh, if every flight attendant got on the flight and said, in my last flight, when there was a crash, this was really yeah. important information that I shared. So Everybody I would listen. take out their heads. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But now you can actually say that in my last course. Or right. you know, yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, Dave, this has been a real treat. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on the show and, and chatting with me. Um, I want to get to some some rapid fire questions in a minute, but um, before we go, I know you have your own business and you're involved in a bunch of other things in the in the Bay Area and outdoor education, risk management related. Tell us a little about what you're going on, what you have going on, and and the best way for people to get in touch with you if they want to follow up. Sure. Thanks. Um, my business is called Ready SF, and the website is readysf.com. Um, we sponsor a lot of wilderness medicine courses in conjunction with Knowles. And then independently, I run a lot of um, first aid and CPR classes for schools, businesses, wineries here in the, in the Bay Area. Uh, and the wineries has been, that's been actually a pretty fun one because um, hmm. they, they pay and they give wine, which is um, wow. not during the training. But They don't pay in wine, do they? No, which is good because I can't, I can't give that to, you know, I can't pay my bills with wine. Well, maybe right. I could, but... Uh, um, <laughs> And I do risk management consulting for, for outdoor programs and a lot of emergency preparedness training, uh, running mm -hmm. drills and scenarios for, for schools and groups um, in, the, in the Bay Area predominantly. Um, and that's, yeah, we, you know, we've been a little bit of a transition with um, COVID, but mm -hmm. things are, we started doing some hybrid stuff, some hybrid learning with, I developed some online stuff and then would do some skills verifications in person outside to sort of limit contact time. Um, I'm one of the, California has an ep, a new epinephrine law and Knowles is one of the provi uh, approved providers as am I. So I do a lot of independent epinephrine training. So then if you, if you take one of these approved trainings with the state, uh, you can then, it basically broadens Good Samaritan provision. So you can get epi that's not prescribed to anybody. And if someone needs epinephrine, you can, um, you can confidently inject them without worried about, you know, you're taking your, you know, someone right. else's prescription drug. So I've been doing that with a lot of organizations, which is great because more access to epinephrine um, Absolutely. without people being concerned about, you know, legality issues is, is a nice one. Yeah, for sure. All right. And the best way to get in touch with you? Um, website is readysf.com. Um, my email, well, Yakubian is a little bit tough to spell. So info, mm -hmm. I-N-F-O at readysf.com will get to me as well. Awesome. And there's a phone number on the website too. Right on. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's finish up with our rapid fire questions. All right. What is your favorite location to lead trips? Well, I'm going to say uh, Harriman Fjord in Prince William Sound. Mm. I've, I've worked a couple of courses up there. Um, Beautiful spot. And I've done a, a couple of solo trips and I think it's going to be off the, the docket um, because there's concerns about um, a tsunami uh, that would be pretty significant uh, and I, I know I'm working a course up there this summer and we're going to a different part of Prince William Sound. Hmm. Um, but that area is just amazing. The glaciers, the cabin glaciers, the sea otter pups, the seals, whales. It's um, yeah, that's a, that's a happy place for me. Nice. What's your favorite piece of gear? Well, I'm, I was thinking about what Kate Coon said and I immediately <laughs> nodded. I was like, Oh, pee bottle. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a founding member of the Walnut club, which is, um, people that need to go to the bathroom a lot, it seems like, and uh, who stay hydrated. So I, I would say for, um, and I like comfort. So a pee bottle would be one, but outside of that, um, I've got this old windbreaker that I've had for a really long mm. time. It's got kind of a thin fleece on the inside and, and a little bit of wind protection. And it seems to um, serve many purposes. Right on. All right. So what's your best backcountry costume or costume that you've seen? Um, I had the good fortune of doing a Grand Canyon trip with some friends mm. a few years ago. And there's this series of rapids called the Roaring Twenties. And the, the trip leader, this friend of mine said, okay, on wherever we were camping there, um, we were gonna do like a twenties party. So everybody had to show up in um, like, are, were flappers in the twenties? I don't remember, but sort of like um, 
you, you had to do your own research on on 20s uh, attire. And, and it was just phenomenal because it was June. It was super hot. And uh, I went and bought a suit at uh, Goodwill and I cut it at the knees and I cut the um, sleeves off. And I and I rode in a, in a suit all day. And, and um, some other folks had these great outfits. But then when we went to camp, they just took it up a level and people had these uh-huh amazing dresses because you know when you're rafting you can carry so right. much stuff so we had like 15 people just dressed in these it was just it was great and it was um wow. i haven't been able to top that yet yeah that, that would have been nice to have a visitor come by the park rangers checking in on you or something what, right, what's, up, right. what's up guys yeah what's happening here so is, is there a film on location here <laughs> yeah, right. wow yeah. all right was, what Im- what image comes to mind when you hear the word adventure um, when I hear the word adventure, uh, I think what comes to mind for me is, uh, possibility, um, mm-hmm. possibility for something new, uh, something unknown, um, and hopefully fun and, and possibly challenging, but, uh, just, I think the word possibility mm-hmm. and, and I always, uh, it's, and it's outdoors, like indoor adventures mm-hmm. just aren't as aren't as fun. So um, if it's an indoor Absolutely. adventure, something probably went wrong. Uh, so <laughs> out, outdoors and, and possibility. Yeah, right on. All right. If you could go back to any one location and share a hot drink in the field, what location would that be? What spot? Hmm. I need, to, you know, um, I was fortunate to teach some wilderness medicine courses in Bhutan in the last couple of years and then do no a, an alumni trip um, I helped put together an alumni trip to Bhutan. Wow. We came back February of 2020 and then everything closed down. Um, and there is a, a peak that we went to that just has this amazing view of, of the Himalaya. Um, and they've got these, you know, the snow covered mountains there you're not, um, that are in Bhutan are not supposed to be climbed. And uh, Jomalhari is this one peak, I think it's 23,000 feet. And it's just absolutely breathtaking. I remember going up to this knoll and just, you know, by myself, just up from camp and sitting there. And um, I would love to be transported there with a few people just to, mm. to have them be able to see that same place. Wow. Yeah. Bhutan is definitely on my list. I hear nothing but great things about it. But yeah. I'm sure there's a, a lot of people clamoring to, to climb those mountains someday. Yeah. Yeah. There's not yeah. that many, you know, untouched ranges in the world, let alone no. Pacific no. Mountains. Wow. That must have been a neat experience. It was. It was really, and it, just a wonderful experience with the folks as well. Right on. Awesome. Well, this has been a real treat. I really appreciate you coming on. I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to stop recording.